I think we're ready to start. Thank you all for being here. Good morning. Go ahead. And welcome to this morning's hearing of uh, our Commerce, Manufacturing, and Trade Subcommittee. And I'm pleased to say that today we will be hearing from two stellar panels, one composed of the private sector leaders and another composed of local and state leaders charged with promoting tourism within their communities. Both groups will be able to offer their firsthand knowledge of the importance of tourism to our economy and why Congress should be paying attention to this industry and finding ways to promote its growth. The travel and tourism industry provides good middle-class domestic jobs almost by definition that can't be outsourced. According to Marriott's testimony, a new hotel opening can generate a thousand permanent new jobs. For every five new hotel rooms they build, three American jobs are created. This does not take into account construction jobs or other indirect jobs that go into the building and maintenance of the property. The U.S. Travel Association will describe a similar statistics for every 33 travelers who visit the U.S. from abroad. One U.S. job is created, they claim. And, as if these numbers aren't convincing enough, we'll also hear from the restaurants about how their members employ 13.1 million Americans, thanks in large part of 25% of their sales coming from the travel and tourism dollars. These numbers are impressive. And as someone who once worked in the service industry at an amusement park and in restaurants, I can attest that the jobs created when restaurants, hotels, and amusement parks grow are good, honest, paying jobs that can help our young people find work and perhaps open their eyes to a career of unlimited growth. What is not impressive and what I'm concerned with is the current status of the U.S. when it comes to competing for foreign travelers. In 2000, the U.S. had 17% of the worldwide market for tourism. Today, we're somewhere around 13%. Why has there been a decrease? The average overseas traveler that visits the U.S. spends around $4,500 and 18 nights per trip but we're getting fewer of these travelers to visit the U.S. In 2010, Congress passed and the President signed into law the Travel Promotion Act. This law, among other things, authorized a public-private corporation known as Brand USA. While Brand USA is not the main subject of today's hearing, I can say with a high level of certainty that it will be the subject of a future hearing now, however, as many brand board members and supporters are sitting before us today, I would like to hear specifically in dollars and cents how you think Brand USA has helped your businesses and by extension our economy. I would also like to hear from the local tourism directors that uh, what role the federal government has in this type of program given that Visit Florida alone plans on spending $63.5 million in FY13-14 on travel promotion. So thank you to this panel and our next panel for uh, traveling to Washington, D.C., uh, spending a night in a hotel, hopefully, and spending some money in our restaurants. I look forward to your testimonies and now yield uh, the remaining minute to the gentlelady from Tennessee. I thank the chairman for yielding, and I tell you, in Tennessee, we are uh, pleased with what happens with our tourism industry. And, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a statement from the Tennessee Department of Tourism Commissioner, Susan Whitaker. Without objection, so ordered. And uh, Commissioner Whitaker oversees a $15.36 billion industry in our state, employs 143,000 Tennesseans, and she is a true travel professional. We appreciate her good work, and I yield back. Thank you. I'll yield back the last 44 seconds and now recognize the ranking member of the committee, Jan Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for yielding and for holding this important hearing. I welcome all our witnesses and look forward to hearing from them, um, from me especially, um, Ms. Speckman, who I am glad is here today uh, representing Chicago's North Shore Convention and Visitors Bureau. It happens to be my home area. Um, travel and tourism play a major role in our country's economy with almost 8 million Americans in jobs tied 
to the tourism industry. It is important to determine how well the United States is doing in comparison to other countries in attracting foreign visitors. It is also important that we evaluate best practices in attracting visitors, both foreign and domestic, to different locations around the country. We can learn a lot from our panelists about what strategies are working and how they can be implemented. Promoting travel and tourism is a national priority, and the House has worked in a bipartisan effort to promote the industry. The Travel Promotion Act of 2009, which established the nonprofit corporation to promote travel to the United States and of which I was a co-sponsor, is just the most recent example. Last year, President Obama brought our national effort a step further by designating a task force on travel and competitiveness, which outlined a strategy to attract more foreign travel. The strategy included coordinated promotion of the United States as a destination of choice, efficiency measures to facilitate easier travel to and from the U.S., enhanced customer service, and performance-based measurements. It is a strong guiding document to help facilitate increased travel and tourism to the United States. From the greatest city in the world, that would be Chicago, um, to the home of Abe Lincoln, to abundant activities in the great outdoors, my home state of Illinois has something for everyone. The state is actively engaged in advertising efforts to attract new visitors, and it has made planning Illinois travel easy with the EnjoyIllinois.com website. By ranking in the top 10 states for both domestic and international travel, and with $32 billion spent by visitors to Illinois in 2011, the effort to attract travel and tourism is paying off. My district has benefited significantly from the travel and tourism industry, and I look forward to hearing from Ms. Speckman about what has made Illinois and the North Shore so successful in attracting visitors. I look forward to learning from the expertise of our witnesses and leveraging their insight in order to enhance national, regional, regional and local tourism. And I will yield the uh, remainder of my time to Dr. Christensen. Thank you for yielding, and thank you, Chairman Terry and Ranking Member Schakowsky, for holding this hearing on the important role that tourism plays in the U.S. economy. And it gives me a chance to highlight the role it plays in the economy of my district, the U.S. Virgin Islands. Whether it's because of a natural or financial disaster, many of the districts we represent are economically challenged. The sequester is only exacerbating this crisis. Fortunately, tourism, with some minor ups and downs, like healthcare, has been what has continued to create jobs and keep many of us afloat. Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce an individual who can outline the importance of this sector to our community and the person who, with excellence and passion, leads our Department of Tourism in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And she'll be on the second panel. But let me just say a few words about Beverly Nicholson Doty, who was appointed our Commissioner of Tourism in 2007. Earlier in her career, Commissioner Nicholson Doty served as the Executive Director of the St. Thomas St. John Hotel and Tourism Association, and she was the President of the USVI Hotel and Tourism Association in 2004. I had the pleasure of being at the meeting uh, when Mrs. Nicholson Doty was elected the Chairwoman of the Caribbean Tourism Council of Ministers and Commissioners in 2012. Under her direction, the U.S. Virgin Islands has experienced noteworthy growth in airline and cruise industry travel, including the return of the cruise industry to St. Croix. And under her leadership, we've seen our tourism product improve to meet the changing demands and to remain competitive. I'm happy that she's here with us today to share her insight and experience in the tourism industry. I have a lot more to say, but I'll save it for my five minutes, so let me welcome all of our witnesses here this morning and yield back my time. I yield back the remainder unless there's, okay. I yield back my time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'll yield uh, to the gentleman uh, one, one or two minutes, Lance, Leonard. <laughs> One and a half minutes to the gentleman from uh, New Jersey, the vice chairman of this subcommittee. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, tourism is one of the top job and revenue-yielding industries in this country, and it certainly has a large economic impact in New Jersey, which attracts tourists for work and play uh, to rural and urban settings alike. Whether for sports events in the Meadowlands in northern New Jersey, and the Super Bowl will be held there next winter, uh, federal area history in central New Jersey, places uh, including the Battle of Trenton and the Battle of Princeton, important in our nation's history, or agricultural uh, venues throughout the state, 
there has been tremendous growth in the volume of visitors and in the size of their economic impact. Uh, the industry generates $17.8 billion in consumer spending in New Jersey and directly supports over 150,000 jobs. Uh, Many will recall uh, the Jet Star, a much beloved roller coaster at the New Jersey shore in the town of Seaside Heights, which became iconic of damage from Superstorm Sandy when it was submerged into the Atlantic Ocean last October. Despite Sandy, New Jersey experienced a record setting year, and we hope for an even better year this year. Concerns within New Jersey's tourism industry are familiar to other states as well. Struggles over seasonal or part-time worker coverage within the Affordable Care Act make it difficult to forecast business expenditures. Tax uncertainty causes confusion for those who own small businesses, and I know Congress is working on that in a bipartisan capacity this year. Just last year, 2012, the U.S. recorded a $45 billion trade surplus for travel and tourism and international visitors spend an enormous amount of money here in this country. Bringing more tourists to the United States will improve those uh, figures and boost employment. We owe our tourism-supported businesses clarity in regulatory matters so they can focus on doing their job and bringing revenue streams into their communities. Uh, and certainly, I welcome all visitors, domestic and foreign, to this country and, indeed, to New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Arrakis, for his minute and a half. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for holding this hearing. From my perspective as a Floridian, this is an excellent hearing topic. Florida is a global hub for commerce and travel, and the state is an exceptional attraction for tourism. Whether you would like to enjoy a nice walk on the beach, some sunshine, some excellent seafood, spectacular nature, and wildlife, roller coasters, or professional sporting events. Florida has something entertaining and relaxing for everyone. Tourism is the lifeblood of the Florida economy. More than one million Floridians are directly employed by the tourism industry. Throughout our entire uh, country, one of, of every eight American jobs depends on travel and tourism. Last year, international travelers to the United States spent more than $128 billion. Increased tourism means more Amer for America and for Floridians, more jobs for Americans and Floridians. I, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the economic importance of tourism and how we can support it. In particular, I welcome Mr. William Seckham to the subcommittee. Mr. Seckham serves as the president and CEO of Visit Florida, the state of Florida's official not-for-profit tourism marketing corporation. Visit Florida serves as Florida's source for travel planning to visitors from across the globe, and I look forward to his testimony, his, of course, his presentation before this committee, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Perfectly timed. And now the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long, is recognized for your minute and a half. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's indeed an honor to have you all here today and talking about tourism in the United States, and particularly I want to talk about tourism in my district and that being Springfield, Branson, and Joplin, Missouri, southwest corner of the state. And uh, there was a lady named Hershend that uh, her and her family found a little cave, Marvel Cave, down in just south of us, oh, probably 30 miles back in the late 50s, and developed the cave, thought people would like to take tours of this cave. And then they decided, well, maybe they'd build a little theme park, an 1880s theme park around it, and that grew up into Silver Dollar City. And now they just announced a year ago that they're going to build the world's largest roller co wooden roller coaster with the steepest drop, 81 degree drop, three inversions. When they announced that, to tell you the impact of tourism in this country and internationally, when they announced that in Europe, they had people from Europe literally that bought plane tickets, came over, got hotel rooms, and rode the little train around Silver Dollar City where I used to ride with my grandmother. I loved it when they'd hold her up on the train and rob her. But, uh, and uh, you all hear static in the background? But uh, now those people came just to see where this was going to be built, this uh, large roller co wooden roller coaster. From that, I I'd also tell you that my hometown is Springfield, Missouri, where a young college kid 
had a dream of putting a few fishing lures in the back of one of his dad's brown derby stores and said, Dad, I think we can sell discount tackle. That has grown into Bass Pro Shops, which is headquartered in Springfield. Drew over 7 million visitors to Bass Pro Shops in Springfield, Missouri last year, and 1.9 million to Silver Dollar City, not to mention all the folks in Branson, which is the leading tourist destination in the United States, in my opinion, anyway. I rest my case. Mr. Long. Now I recognize the ranking chairman of the full committee, Mr. Henry Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm pleased you're holding this hearing on tourism in the United States, and I especially thank you for inviting uh, Ralph Witzel of the Discover Torrance Visitors Bureau to testify on the second panel. Discover Torrance has worked diligently to promote uh, Torrance, California, and the broader beach cities, South Bay region, including Redondo, Hermosa, and Manhattan beaches, as an attractive location for both leisure travel and business conferences. These communities have stunning views, exhilarating water sports, and, the, and incredible restaurants, and they provide affordable lodging with access to two major airports and attractions throughout the Los Angeles area. Today, travel and tourism is one of our nation's top service industries. According to the Department of Commerce, over 7 million people are employed in jobs related to tourism. These jobs mo won't move offshore, and they often provide Americans with significant opportunity for advancement. My home state of California is a major tourist destination for Americans from all over the country and is the Trans-Pacific Travel Gateway. The tourism and hospitality industry is an indispensable source of jobs and revenue, particularly in Los Angeles, which welcomed a record 41.4 million visitors in 2012. The congressional district uh, I'm proud to represent in Los Angeles is the home of world-class tourist destinations like Beverly Hills Rodeo Drive and the Santa Monica Pier. My district also has lesser known but wonderful destinations like the Conejo Valley, and I applaud the city of Agoura Hills for joining with Thousand Oaks to establish a tourism initiative to attract more travelers to this beautiful region. President Obama de demonstrated he, he understands the value of tourism promotion. O one year ago, the administration released a national travel and tourism strategy that created a blueprint for effective federal, state, local, and industry coordination to promote travel to locations nationwide. This strategy, uh, along with other efforts, has had an impact, particularly in attracting greater numbers of international visitors who tend to travel for a longer period of time and put more money into the economy. Just yesterday, the Department of Commerce released data showing that international visitors contributed $43 billion to the U.S. economy in the first quarter of 2013 which is an increase of nearly 3 percent when compared to last year. Uh, I've all, all long advocated for a national tourism strategy that works for both internationally known attractions like Rodeo Drive and those that are lesser known like the pristine beaches of the South Bay. I also support efforts to ensure travelers have a positive experience throughout their trip, whether renting a car or booking a hotel room or dealing with govern government entities like TSA and the National Park Service. It is these insights and hearings like this that will enable us to better as understand tourism promotion so that we can work together to maintain strong growth in travel and tourism industries. I look for forward to all the witnesses' testimony and to our discussion at this hearing. I just have to say, unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, there is another uh, hearing going on in another subcommittee and energy policy that I also must attend, so I'll be back and forth. But I, I thank you for holding this hearing. It's an important one, and I'm glad all of our witnesses here today, whether you're hearing about California, which is the primary wonderful destination for people all over the country or the world, or Chicago, which is called the second city, <laughs> <laughs> for good reason. All of us represent uh, places that you all want to see and visit and spend a lot of money. Thank you. <laughs> then Omaha must be the third city. And we are uh, very proud of our pristine sand bars uh, along the Missouri. Uh, at this time, I'm going to introduce our uh, first panel. 
We have Roger Dow, President and CEO of U.S. Transport or Travel Association. Kathleen Matthews, Executive Vice President and Chief of Global Communications and Public Affairs for Marriott International. Uh, Brian Rothery, uh, Assistant Vice President, Government Affairs for Enterprise Holdings. Uh, Lori Gaydon, Senior Vice President, America HR and Global Reward Intercontinental Hotels Group. Thank you. In Hudson Real, Senior Vice President, Research and Knowledge Group, National Restaurant Association. And some of you are familiar with this process. Uh, each of you will get five minutes. We'll go from Mr. Dow to Mr. Real. Uh, you've got a light in front of you. When you see the yellow, that means uh, think about your conclusion. So, Mr. Dow, uh, we appreciate your testimony. You were recognized much, uh, for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Terry, uh, I have to say this panel is extraordinarily well versed in the facts uh, I could just leave right now because you've uh, you've covered all the pertinent facts but maybe I can add a little color. I've had the opportunity I, I grew up in your state and I've lived in six of your states uh, thanks to this great industry. Uh, so it's uh, terrific to be here. U.S. Travel is the uh, nonprofit uh, organization that represents all of the travel industry. I had the pleasure of uh, testifying before this subcommittee last year on the economic impact, and I return with some good news. Uh, you've stated the numbers extremely well. We're $885 billion to the U.S. economy of people that get their paychecks from folks like this, but another uh, $1.2 trillion when you think about all the people that make the vans and the signs and the flowers, et cetera, $120 billion in taxes. We're kind of the darling of the economy. Uh, when you look at, just as you said, jobs, uh, Mr. Long, one in eight uh, jobs, and, and in Florida you've talked about jobs, how important they are. And uh, we're in the top ten employers in uh, all 48 states, uh, territories, and the District of Columbia, two states not, but 48 of the states, and that, that is terrific. And uh, I want to talk about one of the more lucrative uh, sectors, and that's overseas travel. Uh, 30 million overseas visitors came to the U.S. last year. Uh, they stay longer, 18 nights on average. They spend more, $4,500 per person. And as you stated, every plane that lands, 33 of them add one new American job that can't be uh, outsourced. Uh, we've been a very resilient uh, group, restoring 85% of the jobs lost in the uh, downturn versus the rest of the economy, 69% and being the number one service export with $160 billion to the U.S. economy. So every 1% that we improve adds another $1.6 billion that wasn't here. These folks leave their money and they go home. It's a, a wonderful thing for our economy. Uh, when you Department of Commerce uh, just said uh, their numbers they released, we're growing three times faster than all other industries. And enormous potential. You talked about 17% share uh, 10 year, 13 years ago in 2000, now 13%. So it just shows the opportunity. Uh, I come with some good news today. First of all, uh, Brand USA, thanks to the support of so many of you, was enacted that, uh, the Travel Promotion Act fr from the Travel Promotion Act, which uh, three years ago passed. And Brand USA promotes the U.S. as a destination. It levels the playing field. Uh, the gentlemen from California and Florida are blessed with huge uh, budgets to promote, but so many other states aren't and territories. And this gives an opportunity to level the playing field across America, and I think it's one of the important roles. And even for Florida and California, until people decide to come to the U.S., their dollars don't go very far. So this brand USA does a great job of get, getting people to understand U.S. Uh, it just starting out, brand USA has done a tremendous job of improving that important statistic of intent to travel here, double digits in the countries where they're promoting uh, double digits intent to come to the U.S. So it's going to be a huge opportunity, and as you all know, not one penny of taxpayer funds uh, fund brand USA. Uh, the second thing is uh, the visa wait times. Have uh, A lot of good things have happened. State Department has driven down the visa wait times by 90 percent. It used to be over 100 days to get a visa interview in China and Brazil. It's now under 10 days and actually about five days. Adding visa waiver countries, we went from 27 to now 37 with Taiwan being added uh, in, as the 37th visa waiver country in November. And those countries do a tremendous amount, uh, already improving travel. When South Korea went to the visa waiver program, since in the last three years, South Korea is up 63 percent. 1.2 million visitors, 4.2 billion dollars, 34,000 jobs. 
And there's legislation before you all, and uh, one of my colleagues will talk a little more about that, the JOLT Act, which is very important to keeping these wait times down, adding visa waiver uh, countries from low-risk countries like uh, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, Poland, very important to your area, and uh, Israel, uh, so very important. It's also important that that JOLT Act asked to test secure video conferencing uh, for interviews in, very, in many remote areas. So we have 37 co-sponsors on the JOLT Act. I hope those that are not co-sponsoring will do so. And, uh, but all this is, goes for naught if we don't do a better job of getting people into the country uh, through customs. We've got this funnel that we've built here and customs and uh, border protection are operating as best they can with the resources they have, but they are resource constrained. To me, it's just like having two cashiers at Costco on a Christmas holiday or during the holidays that just can't make it happen. So there's legislation in the budget uh, that budget's pre been presented for 1,200 new CBP officers and the Immigration Act and, and, uh, asks for 3,500. And we need those at our southern borders but also at our airports that are very important. Uh, people tell us they're avoiding the United States because of the fact it is difficult to get through customs. A four-hour wait sometimes, which is just inexcusable, and drives people to other destinations. Lastly, business travel is robust uh, for every dollar. We just did a research study came out today. Every dollar spent in business travel uh, yields uh, huge, uh, over $12 in revenue and uh, almost $3 in profit. Those companies that travel more get more business, simple as that. And I ask you when we think about government travel that we really think about not having excess but important travel and you keeping that measure of what is the right travel, where does it add value, and that would be very important. I thank you for the chance to testify, and I appreciate all you do to support this industry. Thank you. At this time, we now recognize Ms. Matthews. Now it's really on. Um, Chairman Terry, Congresswoman Schakowsky, members of the uh, subcommittee, thanks very much for this opportunity uh, to speak on behalf of my company, Marriott International, and also our industry. Uh, Marriott, as you may know, is a global hotel chain of 3,800 hotels, 3,200 of which are here in the United States, where we got our start as a company 85 years ago. We operate in all 50 states, including many of your districts, and I hope we've had a chance to uh, host you at one of our hotels over the years. Our company, I think, is a really good example of the American dream. Uh, we started in 1927 as a nine-seat root beer stand not far from here on 14th Street Northwest. This was the dream of our founders, a young couple, Jay Willard Marriott and his wife, Alice Marriott. Uh, they traveled from Utah across the country in a Model T Ford. That root beer stand became a chain of restaurants known as the Hot Chops, and 30 years after they began, they opened up their first Marriott Hotel, also here just across the river on 14th Street, across the 14th Street Bridge in Northern Virginia. That was the first Marriott Hotel, and it was right near what was called Hoover Field, which is now Reagan International Airport. Today we uh, employ 325,000 people at our managed and franchise hotels. These are across 14 different brands that range from uh, Ritz-Carlton at the top end all the way down to uh, Fairfield Inn at the budget category, but include Renaissance, Courtyards, and Marriott's. We're proud to be part of the economic growth that Roger Dow has just talked about, especially during this economic downturn that we've just been coming out of. And as a company, beyond our profits, we also have a company purpose, and that is to open doors to a world of opportunity. Our number one core value as a company is to put people first. That not only means taking care of our guests, but it also means taking care of all of those employees that wear the Marriott name tag. So my hope today is to provide some information to the subcommittee that will help you further consider and support federal policies that will help us as a company and as an industry to open more doors to that world of opportunity we all aspire to. Uh, as the chairman referenced, every time we open up a new hotel, we generate hundreds of construction jobs, and we can generate in a large hotel as many as 1,000 permanent jobs. This is also contributing millions of dollars in tax revenues into um, government. 
And our hotels become a focal point for so many things in the community, community events, meetings, and they also spark additional development. So a hotel going into a place like Times Square can transform Times Square into a place that brings tourists back again and again. And just as a local example, several blocks from here, we have construction cranes right near the um, D.C. Convention Center on 9th Street. This will be the site of the new Marriott Marquis, which is going to have 1,100 rooms, will spark tourism to our nation's capital, and will have thousands of jobs associated with that new hotel. Beyond the immediate jobs, we always like to talk about the ripple effect or the multiplier effect in our industry because the opportunities we provide boost disposable income that is reinvested into the local economy. This is the disposable income created by salaries but also by our supply chain as a company. And partnering with global researchers right now, we're mapping that ripple or multiplier effect, specifically what any new hotel in any one of your districts would mean to the local uh, community and the local economy from our suppliers, our vendors, uh, and all the people that we do business with. We're just in the beginning stages of this research. We're really excited when it's completed to be able to share it with you as we are sharing it with governments all over the world because this kind of a thing is happening everywhere around the world where we're building hotels and where travel and tourism is really growing. Um, but just kind of bottom line, we know that for every full-service hotel, like a Marriott, we send millions of dollars of buying power back into local communities through the salaries and supply chain. And as you said, Mr. Chairman, for every five full-time hotel room, full-service hotel rooms that we add to the system, that creates three jobs. So five hotel rooms, three new jobs to the economy. And we also like to stress that these are not low-wage um, uh, low opportunity jobs. Our jobs are a gateway to the middle class for many people, uh, particularly for individuals who have may have not had training because they get the training at our hotels. We cross train, we promote where we're possible, we provide benefits uh, for our employees, and at Marriott, 90 percent of our workforce is full time, even though the perception may be that these are part time jobs. And our industry, I think, is unique in this respect because a housekeeper can become the general manager of a hotel a lifeguard can become the head of a major travel association. Roger Dow, to my right, started as a lifeguard at our Saddlebrook, New Jersey hotel. It was our sixth hotel in the Marriott system. When he joined that hotel, he was told maybe Marriott will grow to 100 hotels. Now we're at 3,800 hotels in his lifetime. So this shows that incredible multiplier effect. And of course, as uh, people join the middle class, they suddenly become travelers themselves. So you see this virtuous, virtuous cycle continuing again and again. And that's why in 2012 we hit that amazing milestone, which was one billion international trips made in the world. These were not one billion individual travelers, but one billion individual trips of people outside their home country, many of them coming here to the United States. So as a company, we we want more people to see the world, and this is a campaign we would love to have you join um, uh, us as part of. Because if we want to get to 2 billion trips, there are a number of things that we want to do. I know my time is, is uh, getting short, so just to re um, reiterate what Roger Dow had talked about, we want to make sure that when people make that trip, that they go to Orlando or to Branson and not just to Paris, which is what the trend has been. So we see other, company, uh, other countries getting very competitive on this front. There's a lot of competition, as you talked about, Mr. Chairman. And so the number of things you could do would be to support Brand USA. Marriott's very involved with that. Our chairman is actually on the Brand USA board. Reauthorizing and making permanent reauthorization for Brand USA is a critical component for us to be competitive. We also want to make sure that we continue to support the President's travel tourism strategy with things like the JOLT Act, and that's another way that you really can support our industry. So thanks very much for your commitment to this. We heard it in all of your remarks, and we look forward to helping you in this campaign to get more people to see America. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Mr. Rothery, you are now recognized. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Terry and Ranking Member Schakowsky and members of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Manufacturing and Trade. My name is Brian Rothery, and I'm the Assistant Vice President of Government and Public Affairs for Enterprise Holdings, which operates the Enterprise, Alamo, and National Car Rental Brands. Chairman Terry, thank you for holding this hearing on the impact of tourism to our economy. The rental car industry plays a vital role in the tourism industry, helping people get from point A to point B, uh, whether they're conducting meetings, visiting family, or taking vacations, and particularly those uh, international visitors that Roger mentioned that spend more and stay longer. Very important. But first, I'd like to point out the special meaning of the name Enterprise. 
Enterprise Holdings founder Jack Taylor served as a decorated pilot in World War II while stationed aboard the USS Enterprise. After the war, Jack began with seven cars and one employee, what we now know as Enterprise Holdings. More than 56 years later, our privately held and still Taylor family owned company accounts for $15.4 billion in revenue and operated 1.3 million vehicles at 8,200 locations throughout the world. That was all in 2012. So a bit about the, the rental car industry, generally speaking. There are more than 18,000 car rental branches in the United States operating a fleet of 1.9 vehicles, producing an approximate revenue of $24 billion. The simplest way to look at our industry is to divide the nearly $24 billion industry into two equal parts. Approximately $12 billion generated at the airport, the other $12 billion coming from the neighborhood locations throughout the communities that you represent. The revenue parity between the airport and the neighborhood market continues to surprise many, despite the fact that these two markets uh, have been roughly of the same size since Auto Rental News first reported that fact in 2006. The industry groups its transactions into three categories, corporate, replacement, and leisure. So the $12 billion neighborhood market is approximately 40% replacement, 40% leisure, and 20% corporate. I'll explain this in a moment. While the $12 billion airport market is approximately 60% leisure and 40% corporate. So let's take a closer look. The neighborhood corporate rental accounts for $2 billion in annual revenue. Examples include uh, an architect renting a car to make a 150-mile round trip to go visit a job site or a state employee making a 200-mile round trip to visit the state capitol for, a, for a, uh, a meeting in lieu of driving their personal vehicle. It's also important to note the important role the neighborhood corporate market plays uh, following natural disasters. The extensive network of locations that throughout your districts and across the country uh, are able to put utility companies, government agencies, insurance adjusters, and catastrophe, team, uh, catastrophe teams on the road to help stimulate that and get recovery underway as soon as possible. Uh, neighborhood replacement accounts for $5 billion in annual revenue, consisting of rentals to consumers who need to rent a car due to the theft or repair of their own car. Many of these rentals are paid for by insurance companies as part of the claims process or are, par or are provided as, car as a courtesy of an auto manufacturer while a vehicle goes under under undergoes warranty repair. Neighborhood leisure accounts for $5 billion in annual revenue. Examples include a larger vehicle to take a family vacation, a cargo van to take a child to college, a luxury car for a special occasion such as a wedding or even a pickup truck to facilitate a weekend project in the yard. Some are surprised to learn the car rental industry caters to the needs of many who do not own vehicles. For many urban dwellers, it isn't practical to own a car, and some renters simply can't afford car ownership. Whatever the reason, these customers rent when public transportation can't meet their needs. Airport corporate rental accounts for $5 billion, which serves the needs of those deplaning passengers needing a car on government or business travel. And finally, last but certainly not least, airport leisure uh, accounts for $7 billion in revenue, which is the largest single revenue category, and it's also the most fun because most of those folks are going on vacation. So a bit about employment in the car rental industry. Picking up along what Kathleen just mentioned, the most recent data shows the car rental industry supported close to 124,000 jobs in the U.S., generating payroll of more than $4.6 billion. Like many of these jobs throughout the travel industry, even entry-level positions in the car rental industry are often more of a career than just a job. In the case of Enterprise Holdings, nearly every member of our senior leadership team all began their career with Enterprise Holdings, just as I did 16 years ago, as an entry-level management trainee. We learn the business from the ground up. That's just the way we do it. So now a bit about the car rental industry and its connectivity to the American automotive industry. In 2010, U.S. car rental companies purchased about one million vehicles from the big three about 16% of the output. Because rental car companies purchase so many cars, the rental car industry provides predictability for the auto manufacturers confronting complex and costly scheduling and utilization concerns. In order to sell used cars back into the consumer markets, rental car companies and manufacturers use a variety of channels, including auto auctions, auto dealerships, and some direct retail operations. Auto dealerships rely on the steady influx of reasonably priced, well-maintained used rental vehicles that are on average one year old with, re with relatively low mileage. Moreover, car rental companies purchase a diverse mix of models, providing excellent exposure for new car uh, introductions. And as consumer studies reveal, consumers are more likely to buy a vehicle after renting it. We play a role in introducing consumers to new technology, including green technology, hybrid vehicles, and so forth. 
And uh, I want to mention one thing as I'm, as I'm getting a, a note from the chair to, to wrap things up. We're here to present mostly positive information about our industry, and it is largely positive. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the one thing that continues to be an impediment to our success. Unfortunately, many state and local lawmakers continue to believe car rental taxes are a convenient way to export tax burdens to non-voters. It's a modern-day version of taxation without representation. Senator Russell Long may have said it best, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax that fellow behind the tree. Today, car rental customers are that fellow behind that tree. The problem of excessive taxation of car rental customers left unchecked can and will harm our industry, and I encourage this Congress to explore ways to address the problem the same way it did for trains, airlines, and buses uh, in previous uh, Congresses. So as the U.S. continues to emerge from the recession, it's essential that Americans continue to travel and rent cars. It's essential that car rental companies and the entire travel industry preserve these meaningful jobs. And I want to wrap up my remarks, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gayton. Chairman Terry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Chairman Terry, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and members, members of the subcommittee, my name is Laurie Gayton, and I'm Senior Vice President of Human Resources for Intercontinental Hotels Group. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on how tourism benefits our economy. IHG is the parent company for two of the most iconic brands in the hospitality industry, Holiday Inn and Intercontinental Hotels. We are the largest com hotel company in the world by number of rooms. Our 676,000 rooms host 157 million guests each year in 4,600 properties in nearly 100 countries and territories. More than 3,100 of our managed and franchised hotels are right here in the United States. IHG owns just five of those U.S.-based hotels. The rest are owned by franchisees many of whom who are small business owners operating hotels in their local communities. As others have testified today, the travel industry is a significant contributor to the U.S. economy. IHG asked Oxford Economics to quantify IHG's impact on economic development, and they found that IHG hotel operations and the spending associated with those hotels support close to 2 million jobs and $100 billion in sales. In 2012, IHG hired 5,000 people in our corporate offices and managed hotels in the U.S. Our managed and franchised hotels employ approximately 220,000 employees in the United States. Last year, we opened 133 new managed and franchised hotels, and we're continuing to grow with 1,250 hotels currently in our U.S. pipeline. We expect to hire 32,000 new employees to staff those properties. Being hired by IHG is often the first step in a long and satisfying career. More than half of IHG's managers and two-thirds of our directors have been promoted internally. Paul Snyder, who's IHG's Vice President for Corporate Responsibility, got his start as a line-level employee. He actually was a bartender at the Holiday Inn in Rolling Meadows, Illinois. And Michelle Chertou joined IHG Paris as a trainee in 1984. During the next 24 years, he worked in different jobs and properties around the world for various IHG brands. In 2008, Michelle became GM of the Intercontinental Hotel in Brazil. In his own words, I've had a very rewarding career with IHG. To progress through so many different roles in so many different places has enriched my professional life and given me a unique perspective on the global hospitality industry. There's thousands of more stories of entry-level jobs at IHG properties providing the first step to a long and rewarding career. I would like to address what Congress can do to assure that travel and tourism continues to serve as an engine for economic growth in local communities across the country. In 2010, Congress enacted the Travel Promotion Act, establishing the first ever national program to attract more international travelers to the United States. It is funded through a matching program of up to $100 million in private sector contributions and a $10 fee on foreign travelers from visa waiver countries. We are extremely concerned that legislative proposals to divert this fee to other purposes could derail what has been an incredibly successful effort to attract foreign visitors to the United States. We urge Congress to protect this funding source from being co-opted by other interests. As we attract new overseas visitors to the United States, it is essential to assure that the process of obtaining a visa and clearing through customs is a welcoming one. 
The JOLT Act, introduced by Representative Joe Heck, would do just that, and IHG strongly supports its speedy enactment. And while we wholeheartedly support Congress's effort to cut unnecessary spending and reduce fraud and waste, federal travel policies must recognize the need for federal employee travel to receive training, to meet with their peers, and to perform their responsibilities efficiently and effectively. In conclusion, by welcoming travelers from around the world, hotels are taking the lead in growing our economy and creating jobs within every state and con congressional district in this country. IHG is a significant part of that growth and opportunity. We urge Congress to act to remove obstacles that foreign travelers face in coming to the United States, to continue to provide the dedicated funding source that will allow Brand USA to promote the United States to overseas travelers, and to assure that the responsible policies allow for legitimate travel by federal employees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. And Mr. Reel? Chairman Terry, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today on behalf of the National Restaurant Association. I am Hudson Reilly, Senior Vice President of the Association's Research and Knowledge Group. We use a simple phrase at the association to tell our industry story. America works here. Restaurants are job creators. We're an interest industry of predominantly small businesses, but together we're the nation's second largest private sector employer. With more than 13 million employees, the nation's nearly 980,000 restaurants employ about one in 10 working Americans. About half of all adults have worked in the restaurant industry at some point in their lives, and one in three got their first job in a restaurant. We employ more minority managers than any other industry. Although many of our members are still dealing with the effects of the Great Recession, last year we added jobs at a 3.4% rate, double the 1.7% growth rate in the overall economy. We're on track this year for our 14th consecutive year of outpacing job growth in the overall economy. The fortunes of restaurants are obviously closely tied to travel and tourism. The nation's nearly one million restaurant locations are starting to gear up for what we hope will be a strong summer season. Our members are looking forward to increased summer sales, but we're also proud of the thousands of jobs we'll create because of those sales. NRA research shows that roughly one in four industry sales dollars come from travel and tourism. The trend is even more prevalent among fine dining establishments where travelers and tourists generate about 30% of revenues on average. In addition, restaurants are also the nation's second largest creator of seasonal jobs during the summer months, with travel and tourism fueling that job creation. In a typical summer season, restaurants will add more than 400,000 jobs. That figure trails only the construction industry. We expect that restaurant employment during the summer months will be up about 7% above January levels. In some tourist areas, restaurant employment will jump by more than 20% during the summer months. The restaurant industry benefits from growth in international tourism. Restaurant operators in the casual and fine dining segments reported that travelers and tourists made up a larger portion of their sales last year than in 2011. And when restaurants do well, sectors from agricultural to transportation feel the benefits. Every dollar spent at restaurants generates $2.05 for the rest of the economy. Considering our projections for restaurants to ring up sales of $660 billion this year, that adds up to a total economic impact of more than $1.8 trillion. The implications for the economy are huge. Our industry is in many ways America's training ground, and we drive careers, entrepreneurial opportunities, and philanthropic contributions in communities across America. The association strongly supports measures to deliver stronger travel and tourism to and within the United States. In particular, we support, one, reducing barriers to international travel, including the JOLT Act reforms in the Senate Immigration Bill, two, stepping up promotion of the United States as an international destination, 
through continued public-private collaboration made possible through the Travel Promotion Act, and three, increasing business meal deductibility. Business travel is an important economic driver within the travel and tourism industry. Many businesses of all sizes depend heavily on restaurants as a venue for conducting business. Currently, the business meal deduction is limited to 50% of expenses. Increased deductibility would bring the business meal deduction in line with other ordinary and necessary business expenses. The National Restaurant Association looks forward to working with this subcommittee and all of Congress on these and other important issues to enhance the benefits of tourism for the U.S. economy. I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Real. And that concludes our first panel's testimony and starts the questioning of the first panel. Uh, and I will start uh, with a simple question, and we can go down in the panel from Mr. Dow, just on down. I, I'm just curious, um, when we want foreign travelers uh, to come into the United States and spend their foreign dollars in the United States, where is our sweet spot? What are the countries that we should be recruiting, Mr. Dow? Uh, <coughs> The sweet spot is uh, Western Europe, uh, UK, uh, Japan, France. The growth opportunity is in Latin America, Brazil, China. China's up 44 percent over the past couple of years. It is a huge opportunity. So Western Europe, very important. Asia, Latin America, the future. All right. I would agree with Roger Dow on um, those opportunity states. The rising middle classes of China and Brazil represent a tremendous opportunity. And right now we're seeing uh, a preference to visiting places like Europe uh, because you can get one visa to travel to all the European, 22 European countries. And so to be competitive with that, we really have to reduce wait times. We've had tremendous progress in doing that. I just got an email from Ambassador Gary Locke last night who said that they've reduced the wait times for a visa interview to two days in China, even during peak season. Wow. But there are more things we can do, such as exploring visa waiver. When we see visa waiver for countries like South Korea, we see a doubling in the number of visitors. So reducing those barriers, making it easier, focusing on trusted travelers really is the way we're going to get that opportunity. I don't have anything to add. Those are All right. Ms. Gaten? I don't think I don't have anything to add. Mr. Real? Within the industry, the results are pretty clear. In other words, if you look at growth in restaurant sales on the West Coast versus the East Coast and the proportion that comes from travelers and tourism, the growth rates are substantially growing higher now on the West Coast versus the East Coast because of the Asian uh, growth in that area. Um, but it, in the end, uh, all restaurant sales end up being local, and it's very important that we communicate to our members the importance that uh, international visitation brings. Because if one is a fine dining operator located in Miami, it's an entirely different situation than being a quick service operator located on an interstate highway. And it's important for them to Good recognize point. those differences. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Dow and Ms. Matthews, uh, Brand USA, is there any way to quantify the impact of Brand USA, Mr. Dow? Uh, yes, uh, Brand USA is uh, a startup. Uh, they began uh, their promotion in uh, UK, Canada, and Japan, and uh, pre and post measurement showed uh, intent to travel here by 11, 12 percent and higher uh, from those countries. We'll begin now measuring the actual travel, but that's an, a great indicator. So, we'll, uh, Brand USA has uh, vehicles in place with the Department of Commerce to measure the activity and show the growth, uh, but it is a no-brainer. You promote America, they will come. I like to say if the tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, well, you know, did the tree fall in the forest? I mean, you have to promote your country. And we've seen the aggressive promotion of incredible India, uh, Visit Britain. And uh, we see the power of that in our own country with destinations and states that market themselves. And so for the United States not to be in that game uh, really uh, basically can hinder the economic growth that we're seeing. So that's why we are so supportive of protecting the revenue stream uh, to support Brand USA so that we continue to be part of that competition for uh, travelers. 
Mr. Rothery? Yeah, I think it's it's important to to remember that it's a uh, uh, the industry needs to match uh, their own money in order to That's draw good down point. funds. And so if there's anyone that has their eye on whether or not it's going to be successful, it's, it's the private industry that's going to be shelling out money. So as Roger pointed out, we can measure in these early days based on the, their previous proclivity to, to go and, and, and look at that based on what actually happened. Um, you know, we're at the very early stages of this, and we are all, uh, you know, eagerly watching to see the results. Ms. Gaten? Nothing to add. America is obviously the world's leader in food service, and when we talk to members about the importance of getting visibility uh, in the decision-making making matrix of these international visitors before they actually depart, in other words, the planning of the itinerary, uh, we're big advocates of obviously placing food service options in front of these travelers before they even depart their, their home. Uh, thank you. And now uh, the ranking member, Ms. Jan Schakowsky, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your excellent testimony, all of you. Um, as we know, the, the, the blunt and arbitrary cuts of the uh, sequester are now in effect, and federal agencies, including those who have been deeply involved in, uh, in, in tourism, have experienced across-the-board um, cuts. For example, the National Park Service issued a, sequestr a sequestration planning memo. It stated um, the National Park's budget could result in, quote, reductions to visitor services, hours in operation, shortening of seasons, and possibly the closing of areas, unquote. Mr. Dowd, do you have any um, concerns about the impact of the sequester on your member companies? And if so, um, what are they? Uh, we have many concerns that uh, travel does not become the face of sequester. Uh, with furloughs, FAA, we uh, fortunately, uh, the House and the Senate stopped what would have been a disaster to save $160 million. We put $9.3 billion and 83,000 jobs at risk, and the Senate and the House stopped that last minute. We're concerned the same thing with getting through airports and TSA, and as you so well stated, the national parks, our treasurers uh, were very concerned that could hurt there. So we, we would love to see smart cuts in the right places versus across the board uh, cuts that uh, will have disastrous impact. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel um, noticed uh, impacts to the tourism industry because of sequester? I'd like to hear them. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, um, you, you know, we're, we're all uh, excited about the stock market going way up and looks like uh, in some aspects the economy is improving. But actually, um, middle class America hasn't seen a raise in a, in a very long time and a lot of people are still suffering um, from the effects of the, uh, the, the economic downturn, the, the, the recession. I'm just wondering um, how over the, the last several years, if you've seen any rebounding, any difference in, in tourism of ordinary uh, Americans, who it seems to me probably one of the first things, not probably, I know, you cut back on is going out to eat, um, taking that uh, long weekend, uh, planning your, your summer vacation, I'm just um, wondering how the economy feels to you. I would think your industry would be a barometer of that in, in many ways. Anybody want to start with a crack at that? Um, I can uh, address that. I believe that um, uh, during the economic downturn, we saw some of the uh, greatest losses in our luxury brands, but really across all of our brands, we saw the impact of uh, the downturn. Um, and not only among uh, American families who were uh, reluctant and uh, couldn't afford to travel, but also businesses that were reluctant to do that. Um, uh, we have seen across the board, across all tiers, uh, growth as we've kind of rebounded from this. So um, whether you're talking about a Fairfield Inn, which could be a family going on a, uh, a weekend, it could be a soccer team that's back on the road, or it could be somebody who is a traveling salesperson, uh, we're seeing those rebounds in those lower tiers as well. One of the other things about this industry is it employs the underemployed. Uh, the number of people that can start in this industry, and as we've been adding jobs 10% faster, you can't do that at Microsoft. But you can go to work down the street at the new Marriott Hotel or one of these restaurants and grow a career. 
there's a myth that uh, we're a bunch of ticket takers and hamburger flippers. We all flipped a hamburger in our time. I'm sure we all did take a ticket. But the bottom line, we're not doing that anymore. And so it's a, it's a career builder where young, sharp Americans can be trained and grow, and we can employ the middle class probably much better than most other industries. Okay. Um, um, true, but uh, I'm wondering if um, in comparison to pre-recession days, if we're, if we're back or we're just climbing back or, um, you know, how, how we compare to those uh, – those times. I'm wondering if we have. In, in the first quarter of 2013, Marriott International uh, exceeded our peak 2007 um, levels for our fee revenues. So that shows that we are back at the level where we had our peak um, uh, production and growth. Is that the experience of uh, everyone on the panel? How about the, the restaurant association? Um, for restaurants this year, the total industry sales will be up 3.8% is the fourth consecutive year of sales growth, although the growth rates are definitely much more modest than prior to the recessionary period. There is substantial, substantial pent-up demand, in other words, what we call unfulfilled demand for restaurant usage among tourists as well as, as residents. Uh, almost one out of every two Americans report that they're not using restaurants as much as they would like in their daily lifestyle. And... Uh, when we talk to our membership about it's very important to have a marketing promotional plan both internationally and domestically to nudge uh, those consumers into that decision uh, to patronize the food service establishment. Right. 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 And at Intercontinental Hotels, which largely in the U.S. were a mid-scale brand, so very much servicing the middle class, occupancy is up. We still have not recovered as well with rate, but we are already we've exceeded the pre-recession levels in terms of occupancy. Great, thank you so much, gentlemen from New Jersey, Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Lance. <coughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, to uh, Mr. Rothery, am I pronouncing that right? That's correct. Uh, you discussed in your testimony. Uh, the fact that uh, taxes on car rentals is a, is a growing challenge for your industry. Um, can you uh, tell us uh, in a little more detail what is happening, how widespread the practice is, and uh, which of the jurisdictions are the worst? Yeah. So there, there are approximately 120 special taxes that go above and beyond the sales tax in that particular taxing jurisdiction. Um, the problem really isn't unique to any one geographic area or state or city. Um, it's really throughout the United States. Um, there, uh, I believe, 43 states in the District of Columbia have some form of extra car rental tax. Of course, not every state has a sales tax, so it's a little bit of a different Are there comparison. states that do not have a sales tax and yet have a taxation on car rentals? Uh, yes, there are. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to be hard-pressed to come up with that at the top of my head, but I know there is at least at least one. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, so, the, so, and they range on, on a variety of different projects, you know, um, most notably sports stadiums is kind of a popular one, um, but they're, 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 it's not unique to one particular area to answer your question. Uh, and it, could you provide the committee with a list of, of what these uh, levels of taxation uh, are across the country? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you. And um, how will Obamacare affect your industry? Um, <clears throat> You know, I don't know that, that we have a, a stance on it that will, you know, that we've formally taken. Um, you know, uh, we provide, you know, health insurance to our employees. Um, and are most of your employees full-time employees? Uh, yes, the large majority of our employees are full-time. Marriott indicated 90% of your employees are full-time. And would that be a similar rate in your industry? You know, I want to be serious about studying the facts before I respond to that question. But uh, intuitively to me... Um, you know, uh, I would think that that would be very close to be true, but I, I can get to the committee and right, actually right. answer. Uh, thank you. And also the same question to uh, the uh, Restaurant Association. A, a number of uh, significant restaurant chains have made public announcements about the need to cut their employees' hours because of Obamacare. And um, if you would update the committee on, on your views on that and where you think we might be headed. Um, a typical restaurant pre-tax operating margin is about 3 to 5 percent of total sales. Um, it's an extremely competitive industry. Uh, it has been and, and continues to be even more so now. Um, when one thinks about 
operating costs for a restaurant, uh, labor costs constitute about a, a third of a traditional restaurant industry sales dollar. And the legislation, I'm just the research guy, the legislation is obviously extremely complex. The industry is extremely fragmented. There are almost 70 distinct restaurant segments uh, that roll up into that $660 billion. Um, so it, it is a complex piece of legislation overlaid a extremely complex industry. And so the, the outcomes are obviously very different for different type of operations and ownerships. Uh, generally speaking, what percentage of your employees are, are full-time? Okay, from a research definition, they're really, um, the difference between full-time and part-time, it's important to think of part-time in four different categories. In essence, you can be full-time, part-time, you can be part-time, part-time, you can be part-time, full-time, you can be seasonal. I'm sorry, I'm not smart enough <laughs> to, un un <laughs> to understand is. that. Uh, uh, well, for the industry, in other words, the industry is seasonal. In other words, sales and different, there are certain locations that are only open for, say, three or four months of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, w there are individuals that work part-time in the industry full-time, and then there are full-time people that work part-time, uh, you know, for a, a certain period of the year only. I see. Um, so it, the one hallmark of the restaurant industry really is its extreme labor intensiveness. Mm -hmm. um, well, as, as we move for, forward, obviously, we, we uh, are interested to know how the new health care legislation will have an impact on the various industries, particularly in tourism and within tourism related to, uh, to your fine work in your, in your industry. And I will make sure our policy people get back to you on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Now the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, is recognized for your five minutes of fame. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for your testimony today. I will try to do this in less than five minutes, and, and let me start with you, Mr. Rothery, if, if we can. Uh, Mr. Rothery, I, I appreciate the integral role that the rental car industry plays in, in tourism. Uh, whether a family is renting a minivan or an SUV for a short weekend or trip, uh, ready access to transportation options is a key to a successful tourism industry. Uh, Mr. Rothery, there has been some discussion about the lack of federal regulation of, of the industry. Uh, in December of last year, at the end of the 112th Congress, stakeholder discussions produced the bipartisan bill S-3706. It is my understanding that there is now broad support for 3706 by both the rental car industry and key consumer advocacy organization. So I want to get you on the record today. Uh, does your company... Uh, support uh, Senate Bill 3706. Yes, we support, uh, Enter Enterprise Holdings supports uh, the effort to uh, 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 codify the practices of the industry, which is to make sure that vehicles that are uh, declared recall by the manufacturers in NHTSA, that they're, that they're safe. And um, uh, there is an agreement between the rental car companies and also uh, consumer groups. And, and why is it important uh, for the industry to be regulated by uniform standards? Well, I think it's important that consumers have a degree of confidence when they rent a car um, that it's safe and it's, and it's safe to, to operate that vehicle. Um, you know, I think it just fairly speaks for itself. All right. Finally, to, to you, Mr. Dow, I, I've served on this uh, subcommittee for some time now. Uh, I was involved in the drafting of the Travel Promotion Act and supported its passage. Uh, the TPA, as we call it, created a public-private uh, partnership known as Brand USA to, pr to promote U.S. tourism to people around the world. It's clear that Brand has been a success with, with international visitors to the U.S. Uh, continuing to increase rapidly. What can states and the federal government do together to make sure we have the resources needed to accommodate more and more international tourists? Well, first of all, <coughs> Mr. Butterfield, I thank you for your support. You were there from the get-go and helped make it happen, so we appreciate that. Uh, what can be done is to make sure that uh, the money for Brand USA stays in place. Uh, it's been said several times, uh, and be, states can work together. What Brand USA does as I mentioned earlier, it levels the playing field. So let's say that North Carolina wants to promote just in Scandinavian countries or Italy. You can do that through them, which you almost couldn't afford to do on your own before. Mm -hmm. So it brings you opportunity to take your dollars in your state and make them very scalable to go after direct markets that you want to go to 
and with matching funds that will come in. So it really stretches your dollars, and it can bring people specifically you want to get to. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity, and the most important thing is we must reauthorize this when it comes up because it is, uh, as I say, it is it primes a pump, and it will build great number of jobs and revenue for this country. And we want our visitors to make repeat uh, visits to the United States, you got not, that not right. just once in a lifetime. You got that right. And that's going to require flexibility. Do you agree? I think it, it yes. certainly is. And, and getting one of the challenges we have is when visitors come into this country is there's not enough people and customs and border protection. So you see in areas like Miami, L.A., New York, uh, some of the bigger airports, O'Hare, where lines can be three and four hours. And these people, I saw one just the other day, she said, our exhibitors are not coming back to this convention ever again. We're going to the conventions in Germany or Shanghai. We can't afford to let that happen. So we, we need to get the resources that these good men and women are just stretched to the max, and that will ensure they come back. And we've done a lot of research that says, if you fix it, we will come. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, if I'm Correct, 2015 is the year that uh, TPA must be reauthorized, but we'll probably start working on it late this year and into. You want to start right now? We're with we're with you. Thank mm -hmm. you very I much. I felt you would be. <laughs> Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Rox is recognized for your five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much, uh, Mr. Dow. Uh, one of the aspects of tourism that I'm interested in is pushing tourists out beyond the typical t tourist uh, destinations. Uh, how can we either attract international visitors to new locations or capture and push those traditional destination visitors out beyond those locations to new cities or destinations for an extra day or two? In other words, we want them to visit uh, Disney. We want them to stay a couple of extra days and visit our sandy beaches on the east and the west coast of Florida. So uh, do you have any ideas on how we can do that? I have many ideas. Uh, first of all, when those uh, visitors come to uh, an Orlando, a Miami, a New York City, a Chicago, an L.A., for the first time, that is where they stay. Then next time, they take, and they'll say maybe seven days there and seven days elsewhere. Third trip, two days there and elsewhere. And I think Brand USA allows you to promote those areas because the travelers today are looking for the authentic destination, the real America, the history, to get to the, you know, get out to the Nebraskas, the Tennessees, places like that, and to other areas in Florida that have the real life of America. So this is a huge opportunity. And if you look at what Brand USA's advertising is doing, it's showing those areas. It is not pushing uh, the Las Vegases and the New Yorks. They're part of the travel, but, but it's pushing people to those areas who don't have the wherewithal to attract those markets. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rao. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised to learn from your testimony about the enormous impact that tourism has on the uh, restaurant industry. Uh, Florida has a large array of unique culinary attractions such as seafood, Cuban food, Greek food from Tarpon Springs, where I'm from, uh, and, and just to name a few examples, can you s expand on how tourism has a multiplying economic factor and how that benefits the restaurant sector and local economies? Absolutely. Culinary tourism, which is the industry term, is a rapidly growing uh, area for the industry. In other words, both domestically and internationally, certain regions are obviously famous for certain cuisines. And in terms of the marketing mix to potential travelers, it's very important because dining is such an important integral experience associated with travel that the operators and the, the visitors and convention associations market specifically the cuisines for which these different regions are known. That's, that's not to say other cuisines aren't important, but it is true when you do the culinary research that certain travelers to certain areas expect to have certain cuisines highlighted in those travel experiences in those areas. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dow, we, we touched on this a couple of times, but this is so very important. Canadian visitors are an enormous source of tourism to Florida. As you know, we have the Blue Jays in Dunedin, Florida. Uh, last year, Canadians made more than 3.5 million visits to Florida and spent more than $4 billion in the state. Seasonal Canadian visitors are uh, integral members of our local communities and economies. Thank God for them. Canada is one of the countries uh, in which the Customs and Border Protection operates pre-clearance 
custom facilities. I understand the CB, uh, CBP is costly about discussing resources levels, uh, of course, for security reasons, as you know. However, airlines are regularly denied additional pre-cleared uh, transborder uh, flights from Canada to the United States because of the capacity issues. Uh, can, can you speak to the benefit of the pre-clearance customs program, particularly from in Canada? And I know you touched on it a couple of times. It's yeah. so very important. Well, I think the uh, pre-clearance is extremely important in the areas that's going on right now because it allows you to look at the uh, traveler in their area. And if you, have, you want to isolate certain people, it gives you that capability. But it, it takes the, the log jam off the Customs and Border Protection people who, I said, are overstressed. And I think that's a huge opportunity. I was just yesterday in Tampa, in, just down the road from you, right. and uh, they're building a brand new international terminal. They could only handle right. 300 passengers. Now they can handle 1,200. Right. And that, when you promote in, in Greece to Tarpon Springs, the, the great area there, through Brand USA, th those people can now get in. So if we can get them pre-cleared in other areas, it will certainly add to the capability and capacity of uh, Customs and Border Protection. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you, it. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And now, Dr. Christensen. Before I start your five minutes, though, <laughs> some people have wanted to take uh, pictures of your person up here testifying. And since this is a tourism, we encourage photos. <laughs> so feel free to just come on. Just don't stand in front. Do what you want to get your photo. Dr. Christensen, you are now recognized for your five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we've been really lucky to hear from some of our greatest experts on the importance of tourism to our economy and what you think Congress can do to make a good thing even better. Uh, so we want to thank you again for coming to share your ideas and your suggestions with us. I don't have many questions. I want to use at least part of this time to put a few issues on the record that are pertinent to my district. First, um, all of you have work within the territories. And we're often left out, so I'm just going to ask for your support whenever legislation is uh, being written that you always rem remind everyone to include the territories where it's beneficial to us. And on the visa waiver program, of course, the, we talked about the bill. The president has his initiative as well, addressing improving and expanding um, the visa waiver program. And while we support also um, expanding it to China and to South America, I know my um, commissioner is very interested in expanding it to South America, we've long wanted to at least have it expanded to extend it for the Virgin Islands to the CARICOM countries. And we have legislation that we're about to reintroduce that would um, create a demonstration program. And to, it's a, there's a precedent in Guam already for visa waiver. We have never had one, but our economy could really use the lift, and it would be helpful to some of the smaller islands in our in the Caribbean as well. So we hope that we can get the industry and um, and the committee support for that when we introduce it. Saint Croix has been very hard hit, as we have lost our largest employer for the whole ter private employer for the territory. We've been on a almost I think it's about 10-year journey to national heritage area for St. Croix. Um, it brings increased branding, funding support, and a longer staying tourist that spends more. Um, it's a des designation that's fully in sync with what our commissioner has envisioned for tourism in St. Croix. And her department has actually participated in the study on which we're, gonna, we're hoping to base our designation. St. Croix has so many areas and events of, that are connected to the nation and to the world. And it's really um, would be a great designation. I'm wondering what in your experience has, what has been your experience with national heritage areas? We have about 40 of them in the country. Um, what has been the experience uh, of each of you maybe would want to comment if you've had that experience of uh, working with the national heritage areas in tourism? This is an <coughs> extremely important area, uh, and uh, as I said, people who want to look at, see these areas, and they're, they're so important, and you mentioned uh, some visa waiver opportunities. These are low-risk countries, and certainly should be included, and that would certainly help these areas that are hard hit, uh, because you've got such a beautiful destination. So I think the more we can push the, the natural beauty and all the things that are important 
and uh, again, Brand USA can surgically allow St. Croix to promote where they need the business and make their dollars really work har much harder than they have been able to on their own. So I think it's a critical opportunity before you. Many of Marriott's um, select service brands um, are located near some of the uh, National Heritage uh, sites that you talk about. We uh, opened up our first uh, hotel on an Indian reservation uh, in the southwest uh, USA. We have hotels uh, throughout the Virgin Islands, and really um, uh, they're some of our Even most beautiful properties. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so as Roger said, we, we uh, would be very supportive of visa waiver uh, for those territories. Um, they are uh, low-risk travelers. And security is a very important concern. As we talk about sort of greater mobility of people, we are also very concerned about security and being smart about that in this visa process. Um, and I think that, you know, infrastructure is so critical. So whether it's investing in our airports, because our airports uh, are not competitive with some of the best new airports in India and in China. And that is a deterrent. So investing in airports, uh, continued pressure on airlift, which is critical to a, a place like the Virgin Islands, and rapid rail is another area of critical importance in investing to get to these tertiary, secondary markets. Um, because if you've got rail and good roads, in addition to newer airports, you're going to really get much more uh, broader benefit to all parts of the United States and our territories from the travel and tourism opportunity that we see. I think I'm running out of time, so um, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Christensen. Uh, uh, next, we will hear from uh, Mr. Harper from Mississippi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome to each of you. Thank you for taking time to, to share the, your input with us. And Mr. Real, if I could follow up a little bit with some earlier questions, uh, just to give you my experience, uh, when we were uh, even before Obamacare passed, I was getting calls from restaurant owners in my district worried about the impact because, uh, as you said, the profit margin is pretty thin. And I've had a number of uh, restaurant uh, owners with multiple restaurants uh, who said that if they had to pay the, um, uh, the penalty or provide health insurance, they would be out of business. And so we've seen a number of restaurants uh, that are doing uh, – taking people who were part-time, uh, making uh, uh, full-time people, uh, turning them into part-time employees, or maybe sharing them with other restaurants. Uh, are you seeing that, uh, hearing that experience uh, as perhaps an unintended consequence of Obamacare? We obviously survey restaurant operators every month, and we ask them about top challenges. And uh, the top challenge obviously now still remains the economy. Uh, the second top challenge now from the restaurant operator perspective is government. Uh, roughly about one out of five restaurant operators reports that that is their top challenge. And obviously part of that is related to uh, uh, the ACA and sequestration. But in terms of their ability to plan. Okay, well, hold, hold on. You're saying the restaurants are saying sequestration is actually having an impact on them? When when. You survey restaurant operators and ask them what their challenges are. Well, uh, you said government. Yes, but, correct. But are you saying that government includes, and of course I can't call it ACU because it's not affordable, so if I refer to it as Obamacare, you'll uh, excuse me. But uh, are you defining it as Obamacare and sequestration, or is that how it's defined within this survey or this question that you do? Well, there basically four challenges for the restaurant operator. Um, okay, I, now, now I'm, I'm, we're on very limited time, so I apologize oh, okay. on that. But your industry is extremely important uh, to tourism. It's important to our economy. But the fact is, if, if you provide health insurance or you have an additional cost, perhaps a premium increase, and Ms. Matthews, I'll talk to you in just a moment with uh, Marriott. Uh, if you have an increased cost, that's going to get passed on to the consumer, will it not? And, and we would have to, I would assume. And, and let me ask you, Ms. Matthews, I know that we all have to be diplomatic, and, uh, but uh, the fact is what we're seeing is a lot, of, um, a lot of companies or chains are looking at this. If they have to provide uh, health insurance at a greater cost, then uh, their choices are, are really three, 
turn them into a part-time employee that will not receive a benefit or have uh, pay that additional cost out of the uh, the corporation or ask the employee to pay a bigger share. It, it, am I correct on that? So uh, Marriott Inter International as a company is very committed to providing health coverage to all of its employees. And as I said earlier, 90 percent of our employees are full time. We actually, during the downturn, provided health care to anybody who was working at least 30 hours. So while we had to cut back hours on employees during the downturn to uh, be able to manage through the downturn, we did not take away their health care, even if they were working under the hours that normally would define full time and part time. We have seen our health care costs go up, but they were going up tremendously prior to mm -hmm. the Affordable Health Care Act being passed. So we've seen that trajectory of increased health care costs. We will see additional costs as we take on new um, uh, enrollees, okay. uh, whether they are 26-year-old children of our employees or people that maybe had um, decided not to take, mm -hmm. people who decide to take the risk of not uh, taking health care coverage. Okay. We're doing a number of things to control our costs, and that's been our approach. Right. So we are very focused on prevention for our employees. We have aggressive programs on nutrition, on exercise, things that can uh, lower our costs. We have a penalty if somebody is a smoker that they now have to pay. So we are looking for ways to manage our costs as we see them going up. But we see this as a combination of just normal health care cost right. escalation in addition to some additional costs uh, by virtue of the pool of enrollees increasing. And I think you hit on one of the things that I, I think is very important, having uh, <laughs> traveled abroad uh, fairly recently, is uh, we are becoming to be at a greater disadvantage on our infrastructure and the appearance of some of our international airports and how we will compete. Uh, as some explained to me in uh, a, a foreign country, it's the, the coolness factor uh, too, and how we compete on that and how we promote our states and our country. And, and for us, uh, Mississippi, promoted as the birthplace of America's music, very important uh, with the birthplace of uh, Jimmy Rogers, the father of country music, B.B. King, uh, and so many others uh, in our state. So I, I think it's important that we all look at ways we can promote, get people into our country. Uh, and thank you very much for your time. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Utah for your five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you holding this hearing. Uh, I come from a state where tourism has always, during my lifetime, been the biggest industry in our state, between our ski industry and our national parks. But it's important we look at this from a national perspective, too, and figure out how we compete with the rest of the world, make sure that we have the opportunities to uh, attract travel and tourism business in this country. So I appreciate you holding this hearing. Uh, I had a question for uh, Ms. Matthews. Um, in your testimony, you cited a number of different accolades that Marriott has received uh, for its human resources policies. And one I noticed is that you've been named one of Working Mother Magazine's 100 best companies to work for in this country. Can you tell me what policies have led Marriott to being placed on that list for over 20 years? Um, Marriott has a um, very inclusive policy. We want the broadest array of ta talent to be able to work in our hotels. And uh, so that uh, includes men and women and people of um, uh, uh, many cultural and uh, minority backgrounds. Um, as a company, we um, uh, have always had uh, very women-friendly and family-friendly policies, whether it's on-site daycare at our corporate headquarters in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, whether it's leadership programs that develop talent, um, whether they are men or women, but we have women's leadership programs uh, that, uh, you know, have granted us these accolades, I would say. Um, I think that you see women rising within the company. Uh, our new um, global officer uh, for sales, marketing, and brand is a working mother with three young children who started um, uh, in an entry-level position in our company. So you see those great success stories uh, within the company as well. So those are some of the reasons why we, we would have gotten those, those accolades. That's great. Uh, Mr. Raley, I have a question that's a little off topic from what you've heard so far today, but to the extent that uh, restaurants need to have uh, or need to avoid having cost pressures to make it more difficult to provide service to tourists, um, this is a question that another subcommittee on this hearing may be covering more, which is impact of government policy on food prices with the uh, renewable fuel standard. 
and the fact that 40 percent of the corn produced in this country doesn't go to food, it goes to fuel. And I was wondering if the Restaurant Association uh, has researched this issue, if they've taken a position on this issue about how it affects uh, food prices for your, uh, for your members. Yes. Uh, going back to the survey about operator top challenges, the third top challenge now is food cost. Uh, roughly about a third of the restaurant industry sales dollar goes to uh, cover food and beverage purchases. Wholesale food price inflation in 2011 was 8.1 percent. It was the highest rate in over 30 years. Um, and this year it's running about 2.6 percent on top of uh, another 2 percent increase last year. So from the operator perspective, there's no way to pass through those costs right. with uh, dampened consumer demand. So it really forces a very introspective look in terms of the operating cost structure and where efficiencies can be achieved. Um, but uh, the, the policy staff has a position uh, on what you're talking about, and I will make sure they get back to you. But in general, from the operator perspective, there's no substitute for stable, predictable wholesale food price inflation. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, so that uh, concludes the questions of this panel. I want to thank you all. You did a wonderful job and were very helpful. We thank you very much. So panel number one, you are now dismissed. Uh, the second panel, if you'll just give us a few seconds to uh, get sorted out here. Uh, Mr. Real, I was thinking you had mentioned uh, this, that about food tourism. So I was thinking about Nebraska and I thought, you know, we're known for our, our beef and our steaks, so to add added value tourism, maybe a, a tour of a slaughter plant. <laughs> there are lots of different drivers for the restaurant industry. <laughs> See how that it goes from cow to pork. If we can get the second panel seated. All right, if we can get our witnesses to please uh, take their seats. Well, I want to thank the second panel, and uh, most of them have been introduced by their respective members who requested their presence. Um, we have uh, Bill Sokum, Sekum, and Sharon Zandra, uh, Zandra Zadra, that was not introduced because she didn't have somebody from Nevada here, but she is a board member with the Reno Sparks Convention and Visitors Authority. Then Gina Speckman, Executive Director of Chicago's North Shore Convention and Visitors Bureau. Ralph Witzel, uh, Discover Torrance Visitors Bureau. And then uh, Beverly Nicholson-Dotty, 
Commissioner, U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Tourism. I uh, thank you for being here, and just like uh, with the first panel, you'll have five minutes. Uh, there's a clock right up here. Evidently, our lights showing uh, green, yellow, and red uh, are not working, so you'll have to pay attention up here. So, Mr. Seckham. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and members, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be here today as uh, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Visit Florida, our state's destination marketing company. I uh, probably have the, one of the best jobs in the world, you know, 825 miles, the most beautiful beaches in the world, the theme park capital, home of American golf, uh, the home of American cruise lines, um, award-winning state parks, and incredible communities from Jacksonville to Tampa to the Florida Keys. And uh, when you think tourism, when you think Florida tourism especially, you think... Uh, it's all fun and games, and in fact, uh, the millions of visitors that come to Florida every day are, are enjoying just that. But it's also the uh, number one industry in our state, and it's a key economic uh, driver, the biggest industry in our state. And I can tell you that the travel and hospitality industry in the state of Florida was uh, the key industry that led Florida out of the uh, recession of the last several years. Uh, it's our vision to make Florida the number one travel destination in the world, and um, we're in a pretty good place to do that. Last year, we had our second consecutive record year of 89.3 million visitors to the Sunshine State, um, over 500 million vacation nights were spent in Florida, and those visitors spent $71.8 billion on hotels and shopping and dining and attractions um, around the state. Uh, to put that into perspective, there are uh, more people visiting the Sunshine State today than live in 11 U.S. states. Um, it's a huge economic in engine. It's a huge driver of Florida's economy. Those visitors will spend $196 million today in Florida. And that generates $4.3 billion in state sales tax collections, 23% of all the state sales taxes collected in the Sunshine State. Those visitors, that uh, 1.6 million people that are visiting Florida today will, are employing 1,053,000 Floridians. It's a huge, uh, huge driver of the economy, and that, that number has been growing like uh, the visitor numbers, 36 months of consecutive growth in the hospitality sector in the Sunshine State. As I look to the future of Florida tourism, I can tell you our next major uh, benchmark is trying to get from 89 million visitors to 100 million visitors. And what does that look like? Uh, I can tell you that the economic impact of reaching uh, to a goal like that is significant. We'd be able to create another 121,000 jobs. Average salary of those jobs, according to Florida Tax Watch, would be over $43,000 per person. So they're, again, big, real jobs for the, for the Florida economy. It would generate an uh, increase in, econo in personal income in Florida of $5.3 billion a year. So for Florida to be able to reach that kind of economic uh, number and be the number one travel destination in the world, um, we're obviously continue to be very aggressive in our marketing efforts, uh, both domestically and internationally. And we're fortunate to have a governor and a legislature in the state of Florida that recognize the importance of tourism and the importance uh, to our economy and to job creation. And they just funded our uh, organization for next fiscal year, an 18 percent increase in our funding. We know tourism marketing works. It uh, works at the state level. It works at the city level, and it works at the national level as well. I can tell you, for us to achieve our vision, the only way we're going to be able to do that is by seeing a huge increase in international visitation. Uh, fortunately, in the last five years, international visitation to the state of Florida has more than doubled, uh, so it's growing. Uh, and that's very, very good news. We had 10% uh, of all Canadians went, visited Florida last year. We had a record 10 million overseas visitors. But the only way we're going to be able to continue to grow uh, moving forward is but with the help of Brand USA. I can tell you that uh, I very much, as long as the entire, along with the entire Florida tourism industry, appreciate your support of, uh, of Brand USA and the Travel Promotion Act. Visit Florida was a founding partner of Brand USA, and uh, our organization, along with 50 other organizations in the state, uh, contributed over eight million dollars to, to Brand USA to help them be successful. Again, destination marketing works, and we know that if we help Brand USA promote the United States of America, you know, rising tide raises all, all ships, and uh, Florida will be a beneficiary. But uh, the success of that organization is critical. And as we heard from Roger Dow earlier, uh, from 12 to 14 percent increase in intention to visit the United States as a result of their initial campaigns, that marketing is working. Again, it's not only good for the United States, it's not only good for Florida, it's good for all, um, all the destinations around the country. 
And what they're doing now with full funding is going into the uh, really a second year of their kind of fully operational marketing program is going to allow uh, them to market in areas in areas and markets that are key and incredibly critical to Florida's future success. Uh, marketing in Brazil, Canada, China, Mexico, the United United Kingdom. So. At Visit Florida, and I can tell you the, not only our organization but the entire Florida tourism industry is 100 percent committed to the success of Brand USA, and we believe that uh, with your continued support of uh, Brand USA, uh, we'll be able to again see uh, Florida tourism industry numbers increase, but also uh, international visitation to uh, all of the United States increase as well. So thank you for your support, and we very much appreciate it. Wow, that was perfectly timed. Ms. Zandra, you are recognized for five minutes. Greetings, Chairman Terry and Ranking Member Chikaski and members. Um, I am Reno Vice Mayor Sharon Zadra, and before you as a representative of the Reno Sparks Convention and Visitors Authority, and thank you for allowing me to be here with you today. The Nevada Commission on Tourism estimates that more than 50 million visitors come through Nevada each year, making tourism Nevada's largest export industry, infusing more than $56 billion into Nevada and providing 30 percent of the state's employment, generating $2.7 billion in state and local tax revenue, which represents roughly 26 percent of all tax revenues in the state. There are more than 425,000 residents in the greater northern Nevada metropolitan area, which welcomes 4.5 million visitors each year. Studies show that visitors to our area report spending more than $450 per person per day, which at an average length of stay of 3.5 days translates into a total impact of $7 billion in tourism-related spending each year. Although we in Northern Nevada are working to diversify our economy with recent acquisitions, such as a $1 billion Apple Data Processing Center, there is no question that tourism will continue to be the fuel of our economic engine. The City of Reno has teamed with private entities to add more than 600,000 square feet of convention and entertainment venues downtown. And certainly the draw of Lake Tahoe, which is recognized as America's greatest lake by the readers of USA Today, cannot be underestimated. But one of the attributes that truly sets us apart and helps drive tourism is our 290-day special events season. Thousands come from around the globe to watch the world's only closed-course pylon air race at our national championship air races. We attract more than 50,000 burners from around the world for the counterculture festival known as Burning Man. More than 11,000 of them fly into the Reno Tahoe International Airport, and that air travel alone accounts for $10 million in economic impact. 6,000 classic cars invade the area for hot August nights, filling our hotels and streets. And new this year, we're bringing the world-renowned car auction company Barrett-Jackson to Reno for one of its four na nationwide events. Tourism is critical to Northern Nevada because tourism creates jobs. Leisure and hospitality leads job growth in our statistical area. It added 1,500 jobs alone in the past year. Tourism paves our roads and builds new ones to support our growing population. Tourism builds schools and educates our children who will continue to direct us at all levels of local government and in leadership roles. Nevada is not alone in its reliance on the tourism industry. And so I plead that every state representative support tourism-related initiatives and to ensure that the tourism industry sees sustained growth. I encourage beginning now the reauthorization of the Brown USA as we've discussed earlier today. Making it easier for tourists to obtain entry visas helps our nation's economy. Surely there may be reforms that are needed, but I believe Brand USA will continue to play an integral role in growing the US travel and tourism industry. Also, please consider legislation that will end the practice of prohibiting travel to locations perceived to be a resort or vacation destination. 
As far back as 2009, some federal agencies have restricted travel to resort locations. Unfortunately, these bans have been decided without consideration for whether or not holding a federal government, government event in the banned locale actually presents a savings or better value to the American taxpayer. My representative, Congressman Mark Amity, soon will introduce legislation to address this. Lastly, if any members of Congress wish to become more involved in promoting travel and tourism nationwide, please reach out to Con Congressman Amity and anyone else on the Nevada delegation. Each works tirelessly to support this industry. Joining the Bipartisan Travel and Tourism Caucus, chaired by Congressman Joe Bonner and Sam Farr, is also a great way to join the solution. To simply summarize, tourism creates jobs. Thank you, Chairman um, Terry, for showing your leadership on this very important issue and allowing me to share Northern Nevada's experience, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Well done. Thank you. Ms. Speckman, you are now recognized. Hi. Chairman Terry, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and members of the sub subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to testify about the importance of tourism to our economy. My name is Gina Speckman, and I am the Executive Director of Chicago's North Shore Convention and Visitors Bureau. I have worked in the travel and tourism industry for 25 years, and I've had the opportunity to see the benefits of the convention industry during my tenure at the Chicago Convention and Tourism Bureau and the impact on smaller communities in my current position representing the cities just north of Chicago. The Great Recession inflicted damage on almost every sector of the American economy, including travel. Travel, however, has bounced back from the downturn far more quickly than any other industry. In the cities I represent, the local hotel tax that is paid for by visitors is a trusted revenue stream made even more attractive as it, as it is paid for, it is not paid for by local residents. Even during the economic downturn, when drastic cuts were made to the budgets of the municipalities I represent, the dollars invested in the convention and visitors bureaus remained intact. Why? Because the investment in tourism promotion has a proven track record of performance, and in tough economic times, the incremental revenue brought in by visitors is more important than ever. Dollars derived from tourism is also an important mechanism for funding economic development initiatives. In the city of Evanston, for example, the hotel tax funds the economic development department and all the initiatives they undertake to bring technology, retail, and manufacturing businesses to the city. Thus, not only does tourism benefit the businesses that count and only thrive with visitor dollars, but the taxes derived by increased visitation is the backbone of the entire city's economic development plans. Of all the revenue sources that flow into the state of Illinois, the hotel tax revenue is growing faster than all other state taxes, higher than liquor, sales, cigarette, motor fuel, gaming, or income taxes. In 2012, the hotel tax in Illinois increased 23.42% over the year. The travel and tourism industry has rebounded back to the levels we were at before the recession. In 2012, $2.3 billion in taxes were created by tourists in Illinois, representing 93.3 million visitors. How many other industries can boast, boast this growth? And of course, one of the main metrics of economic health is jobs. On Chicago's North Shore, one out of every 10 jobs is related to hospitality and tourism. When the recession ended, hotels and restaurants immediately brought on new employees to meet the demand. Though many frontline jobs in our industry are entry level, many are not, and our industry is very proud of the fact that we nurture, develop, and promote talent. Show me a general manager of a major hotel, and I promise you he or she started as a bellman or a front desk clerk. Our jobs cannot be outsourced, and we immediately have the infrastructure to hire staff quickly. In 2010, the Travel Promotion Act was signed into law, which resulted in the creation of Brand USA, <laughs> allowing our country to have a national advertising presence in the international market, marketplace. 
Prior to its establishment, the U.S. had no cohesive national presence and other countries benefited from our efforts by taking our visitors. In a short time, Brand USA has established advertising programs that have allowed states, <coughs> convention bureaus, and private tourism entities the ability to co-market our product and be part of this big effort. For my area, it allows me to finally market internationally in a way that it was not available to me previously or was cost prohibitive. Partnering with Brand USA and the state of Illinois, I will now have videos on and online marketing materials in different languages backed by the advertising force afforded Brand USA. My constituents are thrilled and we finally feel that the tide has turned in fighting for the international visitor dollar. In April 2014, Chicago is hosting International Powwow, which is the international convention of tour operators and we are very excited to be a part of it. Now that Brand USA has established focus to position the U.S. as a premier destination for visitors, we need to continue the momentum of increasing the amount of visitors coming to our country. Passage of the JOLT Act, House Bill 1354, would allow travelers from countries closely tied to the U.S., Poland, Israel, Chile, Brazil, to be part of the visa wa waiver program, expand the successful global entry program, and reduce visa wait times. I encourage you to include provisions of the JOLT Act in any comprehensive immigration reform package. Also, the Travel Promotion Act, as you've heard, is coming up for reauthorization in 2015, and we encourage you to please um, promote, and promote that. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Well done. Mr. Witzel, you are recognized for your five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Terry and distinguished members of the subcommittee and uh, the ranking chairman uh, Waxman also for having me here. For the record, I am Ralph Witzel, the executive director of Discover Torrance Visitors Bureau. We're a 501c nonprofit organization funded by the Torrance Hotels of 50 or more rooms. And uh, for logistics, Torrance, California is situated about 12 miles south of the Los Angeles International Airport. And our goals are designed to increase the economies of the city through sustained growth and tourism spending, which results in significant increases in the economic impact of the areas of earnings, tax collections, and jobs. Uh, we have come to Washington to demonstrate how tourism impacts economic development. Uh, the U.S. Travel Association in March of this year announced that travel and tourism generates $2 trillion for our economy and supports one out of every eight of our nation's jobs. These results have been achieved with an industry becoming more focused and unified while working together. And I'd like to uh, localize my approach to the subject of tourism, collaboration, and jobs. Um, like so many working Americans with me, uh, my position was eliminated and I was laid off in early 2010 and I became a statistic in regards to unemployment. I was fortunate to land the tour tourism job and really appreciated and respected a community that developed this tourism organization and allowed me to be the next new job in California. In turn, I needed an assistant and a sales manager and just like that, tourism created two more jobs Wow, this system is great. Uh, the incremental room nights my staff has booked impacted hotel revenue as well as the dollars the visitors have spent in my community have definitely been a plus. Here we are, little Torrance, California, now getting our share of the California drive market plus a few meetings. I know, small stuff when you look at the big picture regarding tourism and all the discussion here today. But it gets better. I'm a huge supporter of collaboration and realize that regional marketing creates even more economic development. So I approach my neighboring cities, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, and Redondo Beach, and we agreed to market the region as the beach cities, South Bay, Los Angeles. So now I'm not just promoting one city, but my city, Torrance, as the gateway to the South Bay's beach city. This new recognition makes the region much more marketable, accessible, and provides a true Southern California experience for the visitor. Now, Discover Torrance is primed to be a player in the international arena, but even with the partnership with the beaches, probably won't be enough of a factor to say to a young middle-class Chinese couple, 
searching on the internet in, the Shang in Shanghai to focus on the South Bay of Los Angeles for their first visit to the United States. This is where we collaborated with Visit California, our state's tourism agency, and also we're so soon going to collaborate with Brand USA, who both regularly travels abroad hosting sales missions to promote California. These cooperative opportunities allow smaller communities to promote their respective regions right along with well-known icons as Disneyland, Universal Studios, Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and Los Angeles. In closing, I would like to state that California is reaping the fruits of our labor as international travel is California's top export. According to Visit California, the $19.1 billion spent in California in 2011 was equal to the combined value of the state's top four product exports. According to a January 2013 report by the Legislative Analyst Office, employment is the leisure and hospitality sector consistently outpaces almost every other industry. Even during the Great Recession, while California was shedding 1.3 million jobs, travel businesses lost fewer than most, and leisure and hospitality has recovered quickly, adding more than 100,000 jobs since February of 2010, and it is the number five employer with the state. And with that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my testimony. Well done. Thank you. And Ms. Nicholson Dottie, I appreciate your attendance. You recognized. Good afternoon, Chairman Terry and committee, subcommittee members. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Beverly Nicholson Doty, Commissioner of Tourism for the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I bring you greetings from my home and on behalf of the Caribbean Tourism Organization, which I chair. The President's Executive Order announcing a set of initiatives to significantly increase travel and tourism in the United States is a major step forward for the world's biggest travel and tourism <coughs> economy. It is also an opportunity for our territory, the USVI, to look at how we might secure new opportunities arising for this bold <coughs> initiative. We welcome the administration's goal of attracting 100 million international travelers by 2021. Since the announcement, we're pleased to learn strong progress has been made both through the executive order establishing a national travel and tourism strategy and through a series of improvements to the visa processing, uh, to the visa processing. The government's comprehensive approach, which will benefit our growing industry by drawing on the skills of different parts of the U.S. government, we respectfully urge you to ensure that the Department of Commerce receives the support it, to enhance the profitability of an industry which supports the direct employment of more than 7.7 .7 million Americans. We are, we are. There it is now. Can you move the third over? Okay. We are most encouraged by the launch of Brand USA International's campaign to increase visitation to the United States. The U.S. is seeing increased demand in, global in the global travel market, and we look for ways of attracting some of these new visitors to our shores. The President's stra strategy to expand the Visa Waiver Program, coupled with increased funding for U.S. Customs and Border Protection and the TSA, strengthens national security while encouraging legitimate overseas visitors. Full funding of the FAA programs also strengthens our safety and security efforts. Expanding the program will create jobs and bolster our economy by welcoming millions of new international visitors to the United States. We urge our federal authorities to review visa and entry procedures for cruise passengers. Currently, some cruise lines are avoiding U.S. ports on their itinerary, itineraries. One reason cited is the extensive time to process foreign arrivals. This makes disembarking a lengthy and costly process. The development of the national travel and tourism strategy is critically important for smaller parts of the country, like the U.S. Virgin Islands, because among other things, it stresses the need to focus on all our country's tourism destinations in a more consolidated fashion. This is, this is much needed for offshore destinations like Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
it is critically important for island territories of the United States to have a voice in the implementation of the President's initiative to ensure our distinctive issues are addressed. We can also bring a unique perspective to the design of this plan. In the U.S. Virgin Islands, the tourism industry is now even more critical since the closing of the Hovensa oil refinery on St. Croix. This event caused the loss of thousands of jobs with an estimated 20% impact on our economy. In addition, the extremely high cost of energy in the U.S. Virgin Islands places enormous pressure on the tourism industry's bottom line. As an island territory, we are especially reliant on airlift. To the Department of Com so the Department of Commerce survey on international air travelers is, particularly, is a particularly valuable source of information. We regard airlines as an integral part of our infrastructure, just like roadways and bridges on the mainland. Without these aerial highways, we cannot fly visitors to our islands. Without reliable airlift, we would be consigned to the backwaters of the global economy and perhaps a drain on the U.S. taxpayers. We will all benefit from the information collected and we urge Congress to support the continuation of this survey called for in the Travel Promotion Act. Another critically important issue is developing, devoting resources to develop our sustainable tourism industry. This is especially true for a territory like ours, rich in natural resources and cultural heritage. Working in partnership with federal agencies to conserve our natural resources while making them more accessible to travelers is an important step in the enhancement of tourism. In closing, tourism sustainably developed and in harmony with a national tourism strategy enhances our environment, our culture, our wealth, our education, our health and our security, and a vibrant visitor industry keeps our people gainfully employed. Thank you. Well done. Uh, I'll start uh, the first questions with you, Ms. nicholson Dotty. Uh, you had mentioned with the cruise industry, the, will you describe again the problems with uh, when they want to pull into a port in the United States and the visas? Or you had mentioned there's yeah. a problem. Please yes. state that again. Yes, there is an, um, a movement among several of the smaller but very upscale cruise lines where they are avoiding U.S. ports. Uh, we find that they're home porting in, in other places outside of the U.S. And the reason being is that if it takes two or three hours for a cruise line to clear on embarking in a territory, it, it affects our commerce, it affects their bottom line, and therefore they're avoiding U.S. There's something ports. inherent to, to the Virgin Islands, a territory versus I, Miami? I think that we're seeing some of the smaller lines where they indeed have a higher uh, demographic that they are avoiding U.S. ports altogether. Okay, that's interesting. We actually invited the cruise industry to be part of this panel, and they declined. I'm, I'm not sure why. They're a big part of it, so a little disappointed in that. But that's interesting that you, you bring that issue up. Uh, for Mr. Witzel and Mr. Uh, Seckham, <coughs> excuse me, you come from big states with big budgets for tourism. Uh, some uh, detractors of Brand USA would say there isn't a need for a redundant federal program. Do you believe it's redundant? Uh, how do the two work together? Mr. Seckham, you first, then Mr. Wetzel. And by the way, Mr. Wetzel, I think it's interesting in your testimony you said that you, you were going to use Brand That's USA. Right. So I think you have a little slightly per different perspective than this, Mr. Seckham, uh, from Florida. Mr. Chairman, I, I believe uh, it's important to recognize that the global tourism industry is hyper-competitive, and the United States and every destination within the United States are competing against countries and, and destinations around the world uh, for precious you know, vacation time and hard-earned dollars. And um, again, it's incredibly competitive, and the United States having the opportunity through Brand USA to compete at an international level will, um, again, in my perspective, a rising tide raises all ships in Florida as a you know, number one travel destination in the world is going to benefit from that. However, um, I think we're also a microcosm of the United States as well. Um, Florida's got 19 million people. We have 
uh, Miami and Walt Disney World and, and some of the some great businesses, but also as we talk about cultural and heritage, this is our 500th year since Juan, Juan Ponce de Leon landed in Florida, and we've spent an awful lot of time making sure that every destination within the state has the opportunity to uh, capitalize on what is our, our biggest industry. So I think Brand USA is faced with a, sim with a similar challenge as we have, is that it's not just the big destinations or the big ports, but uh, once we expose travelers from around the world to the United States, um, they will travel across the United States and their money will follow. Thank you, uh, Chairman Terry. Um, in, in regards to uh, Brand USA or, or either uh, Visit California, uh, basically uh, our challenge is as a, as a smaller, uh, say, secondary destination is, um, is, is, is we need recognition. And, and so by collaborating uh, with these two organizations and, and being able to, to take advantage of, of their distribution channels, of their sales missions and say, uh, Shanghai or China or Mexico or Canada, uh, it, it just makes sense uh, as in regards to, to my smaller budget for, for me to take advantage of, of the expertise uh, in the international market. Um, I've been with the Torrance uh, Bureau running it for the last seven months, and, and basically there's always been a feeling uh, within California to support Visit California, but if you look at the, the opportunity to, to make sure that we're not missing anything, I think it uh, behoves us to, to look at every opportunity available. Uh, quickly, for each of you, uh, starting with the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Saycomb, uh, tell me what you feel is the greatest barrier preventing or inhibiting in any way foreign travelers from coming into your area. I believe the uh, single biggest challenge right now is, is one of marketing and continuing to uh, continue to raise awareness of the United States as a destination, certainly in Florida. We do have challenges that I think are continue to be important with our border control and making sure that we're providing one security on one hand, but also a, a welcoming experience on the other to, uh, to make it easy so that visitors uh, from around the world are not coming to our airports and waiting three or four hours to, uh, to clear customs and, and, and to, to go through um, Border security. So I think that that would be the single biggest issue uh, near term. And I think long term, our challenge is going to be continuing to invest in um, the transportation infrastructures that we provide the, 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 the kind of welcome that visitors are accustomed to. Well, this is a little bit more of a lightning round with one minute left. Ms. Um The lightning round, the easy answer would be ditto, absolutely ditto for the state of Nevada. The transportation piece is critical for us. Um, as is the, the marketing budget. I would add to that um, a severe need still for the easier, more timely um, issuance of the visas. It's had a remarkable, in a negative way, um, impact on the state. We had an experience in Reno alone um, where an international piece of business that we sought and achieved um, actually performed at about 20% of its international draw because of the visa issue. Um, I think customs and um, the experience of the traveler coming into Chicago O'Hare is an issue for us. Um, we um, are in the we just started, and the city of Chicago is investing five million dollars in upgrading our airport, but it still doesn't dr address the customs issue and the staffing of customs, which are not part of the airport's control. Um, you can have a plane landing and you'll have 300 people come off and only two people working, and it has to do with issues of hiring and hours and union rules, but the experience of the traveler is waiting in line for hours in a very unwelcoming environment of a older airport. So um, a lot of our gateway airports, you know, every time I'm in an air the airport in New York, there's buckets. Every time it rains, there's buckets on the floor. The infrastructure of our airports com compared to our competitors in the world is lagging. All right. My time has expired. I apologize, uh, Mr. Wetzel and Ms. Nicholson. Do you uh, now? I recognize the gentlelady from Chicago, Shakowski. Thank you. Um, so, visits to the United States are highly concentrated in five states. I'm sure everybody can, knows them: New York, Florida, California, Nevada, and Hawaii. I'm sure that. Many visitors also come to the uh, American, um, the, the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, and it's always been sort of a, um, 
I don't know, frustrating to, to me when I talk to international visitors why not more, why more of them don't come to the central part of the country, don't come to Chicago, to the, uh, the, the Midwest. I was uh, encouraged by what Mr. Dow said earlier about um, visitors looking for authenticity um, and wanting to get a real feel mm -hmm. of the United States, and um, there's no more welcoming place, I think, than, uh, than the Midwest and, and Chicago. Um, so I, I'm wondering, um, Ms. Speckman, um, how do you um, broaden the base? I certainly want visitors to go to all these other places too, to these five other states and who depend so much on tourism, but how, how do you broaden the base? And how has Brand uh, America helped uh, help do that? Well, Brand USA has, um, Brand USA. It, you know, it just started too. And we now, the state of Illinois is now in a partner with Brand Illinois. And just last week it announced a program to all the convention bureaus in Illinois which will allow us to co-op and market our areas and c produce collateral and video in different <coughs> languages that is now affordable to us through Brand USA and through the state underwriting a major portion of it, we now can get involved. And really now what we do in trying to get the travelers to come to Midwest and Chicago is to market to what people are looking for, and that is experiences. Yes, people know the big name cities, but people really want to come and see the United States. And a big draw in our area is Route 66, which starts in Chicago and goes to California. Um, we rely heavily, too, on some icons we have, like Lincoln. Um, the movie Lincoln um, premiered this year, won the Academy Award. Well, they did a lot of promotion in the openings um, the state of Illinois did um, in Europe when that movie opened. So what we're really trying to do is show Chicago as a city. Um, a lot of times it takes people coming to Chicago to see how beautiful it is and returning. Um, and people we, are often shocked by that. They're always shocked by I that. Know. They have, exactly, they're always shocked, but they always love it. That's why it's very important that we're hosting all the tour operators from around the world in Chicago in April of 2014, because they'll see our area, and I'm bringing them up to the North Shore, too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to ask you that, too. I saw you um, kind of identifying it, it felt like, with uh, Mr. Witzel talking about, um, you know, Chicago is one thing, but then how do you get people out of the city and come to the, the, the North Shore? I mean, what, what are the messages that you want to convey, and what are the conveniences or whatever? What's the attraction? Well, we work a lot with Choose Chicago, which is the Chicago Bureau, and we are in their visitor centers. We take part in a lot of their advertising and marketing programs so that people that want to see the Chicago Botanic Garden, which is actually not in the city of Chicago but on the North Shore, or want to come to Northwestern University or the Baha'i House of Worship, which is the only one in the Western Hemisphere, let alone the United States. I just took some visitors there last weekend, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is on the North Shore. So people think things are in Chicago when really they are in the outlying regions. So we really try to work together to do that. Um, also, I, I have collateral that I do that tells downtown concierges to tell people how to take the city train. This is the stop you get at. This is how many minutes it takes. Here's where, what you can do when you get off on the L or the metro station in Chicago in the North Shore. And then also we kind of try to um, work and we market to people before they come to the area. You can take the Chicago train from Evanston to a Cubs game quicker, easier, and cheaper than you can from staying downtown, where it costs $50 a night to park and $300 a night to stay in a hotel. Bef um, before I uh, uh, and how are you funded, and how are, how are these travel organizations funded? In, well, every state is different, and every bureau okay. is different, but in Illinois, half of the funding of most of the bureaus comes from the state of Illinois. It has a very aggressive tourism program. Okay. So 6% hotel tax goes to the state, and we get a portion of it. So that's half of our funding, and the rest is through municipality support and membership. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, by the way, according to uh, our tourism, the most visited place by Omahans is Chicago. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dr. Christensen, you are recognized for your five minutes. Thank you. We'd wel welcome them to the Virgin Islands, too. <laughs> um, but thank you, and, and thank you, Ms. Beckman, for mentioning the uh, 
travel and tourism uh, committee that we have, task force that we have here, the steering committee. I've been on it since coming to Congress, and I'm glad that they're becoming active again. Um, I'd like to ask my um, commissioner a question. Um, 2017 is a big year for the Virgin Islands that um, probably not well known. Uh, could you explain what it is and maybe some of the plans of how we can um, use that time to um, expand on our tourism product and, and what role maybe the co subcommittee or Congress should be playing in it? Well, you have um, two important things. First of all, it celebrates our transfer from 2017, which we'll celebrate 100 years of our transfer from Denmark uh, to the United States. So this is a major um, uh, event for us in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Also, it represents 7% uh, of our uh, seven percent of our business is international business. Of that, a full half comes from the Scandinavian countries. However, there are cities within the U.S. that, like Slovenia, California, where there is a very heavy Danish population. What we're looking at for 2017 is how we make that entire triangle. We look at visits from Denmark to the U.S. Uh, Virgin Islands, which we have been um, extremely successful with, but also how do we tie it in, and in some cases to smaller areas outside in um, non-major uh, cities in the U.S. where we can have linkages. Denmark, South Carolina, Minnesota, Absolutely. where there are a lot of um, Scandinavians as well. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments as well. Um, apart from the pa fact that I wanted to um, highlight the fact that we will be celebrating 100 years of being a part of the United States family in 2017. But um, one thing that always troubles me, and I notice that government travel is just a very small percentage of U.S. travel, but any travel to the U.S. Virgin Islands by Congress or by government agencies is always seen as a junket. And, you know, I would like to invite the subcommittee to begin to change that by perhaps having a hearing in the U.S. Virgin Islands to discuss some of the concerns that we have. <laughs> <laughs> some of the concerns that we have that come under the jurisdiction of the subcommittee. One other area that's important to us, and um, I don't know if you wanted to comment on this. Um, well, I probably shouldn't ask you to comment on it as chair of C CTO. But, um, you know, the Virgin Islands... Uh, adheres to all the minimum wage, um, the minimum wage, to all of the labor and other laws. And so that makes us somewhat non-competitive with some of our Caribbean neighbors who don't have to pay the high um, wages or uh, be in accord with some of those laws. We do have the benefit of um, duty-free. And at some point, um, I know this is not in the committee's jurisdiction, but we would be asking to increase our duty-free um, allowance um, to make us more competitive with our, our, our Caribbean um, neighbors. And uh, we'd ask for the support of both the industry and, and the committee. Um, I, I heard Ms. Matthews talk about, in, in her response um, to me, about airports. And is, are there any plans to um, improve on our airport, to expand our airports? Um, I don't know where you would grade them on a scale of 1 to 10, but she seemed to put a lot of importance on Absolutely. the airport experience. Absolutely, and I think that it is a critical area for the Virgin Islands. Uh, the Saint, we have two airports. The St. Thomas Airport, which is considered a medium-sized airport with uh, approximately 700,000 visitors that come through that airport each year, um, is certainly in need of an upgrade, especially as you compare it to uh, the region, uh, the Caribbean region, in terms of the improvements that are being made. But as you look internationally as well uh, at the airports, and airports are a significant uh, source of, um, it's the gateway. It's the gateway to a destination. And so looking at our airports is very critical, and the upgrade that's needed in comparison to the rest of the world. Well, thank you. I don't have any uh, further questions, but I look forward to having a, a, hear a subcommittee hearing in the Virgin Islands in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we can drive there, we can have a field hearing. As, uh, it's I think, aerial a new highway. rule. <laughs> 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 well, it's unstated at this point. Uh, none of us have had the gut yet to ask for a field hearing. <laughs>
So uh, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. That concludes all of the questions that we have for you. Thank you for uh, coming here. And this is a really important issue. This is about jobs uh, that can't be outsourced and uh, hundreds of billions or even uh, some, uh, one gentleman said uh, when you put in all the indirect jobs and money, it's a trillion dollar industry. So I want to thank you for being here. And uh, this won't be our last hearing on the subject, uh, maybe the last for this month on this subject, but we will have more because of its importance to our economy. Now, a uh, couple of uh, uh, housekeeping. I ask unanimous consent to include in the record a statement from the American Motorcycle Association, and it's been shared with the minority. So if without I, objection. without objection, then hearing and so ordered. And remind members that they have uh, 10 days to submit their questions for the record. And uh, ask you guys if you receive questions from any of the members, a prompt would, uh, response is uh, requested. And by the way, prompt uh, for some, uh, usually with more government agencies, is not six months. <laughs> so at this time, we are dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.